Hello and welcome to the Homesteading Academy, where homesteaders come to learn. Today, we are doing a special request topic from Glenda at Grace and Fire, who requested to have information on urban chicken raising. So today we have a very special guest, and it is Kristen from Rising Sun Roost, and she has an account on Instagram. We will have her information both in the description box and also pinned to the chat. So you'll be able to follow along with her crazy chicken mama antics because she is hilarious. And not only that, she has great information and she's just a real person, which is so refreshing as so many of you know. So without further ado, we're gonna welcome in Kristen. Hello. Hey there. Well, hello, Lisa, and hello, Homesteading Academy. Man, I feel so lucky to be here. We're so glad to have you. And as you can see, I tried to put a chicken on the screen in the lower corner, but apparently I've cut its head off. So my <laughs> apologies to the audience. That's what I get for being all fancy-like. <laughs> um, well, that's okay, because I can identify with that. That's often how I feel, like a chicken with my head cut off. So that's very fitting. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. So Kristen, um, you know, I know there's, um, we all have concerns about privacy when we talk about our lives online. And so are there a couple things you might want to share about yourself that you feel are okay publicly? Like maybe what state, if you feel comfortable, if not, we understand. Oh, sure. I'm happy to give a little intro. Um, hello, everybody. I am Kristen um, of Rising Sun Roost. I am a backyard chicken owner um, in, in California, so I'm happy to share that with y'all. Um, I work full-time in tech here in Silicon Valley, so I work at TikTok full-time, um, but I'm also a full-time crazy chicken lady. That is my one hobby, um, and I'm also a mother of little boys. So that is, that is me in a nutshell. Awesome. Awesome. And of course, I've got pigs, so flies are flying around. But <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah. So if it's not a dog barking, a chicken with a head cut off on the screen or a fly flying around, you're not at my house. So <laughs> you're a good company. You might hear my chickens uh, laying their eggs in the background. So <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. So why don't you tell us um, how many chickens you have and, and we can get into it. Yeah, so I have seven chickens. I did not always have seven chickens, um, but I have seven now, and I have a mixed flock. I've got some silkies. I've got a buff Orpington. I've got some Easter eggers, which lay me some pretty blue and green eggs. I've got a Marans. It's it's quite the motley motley crew, I'll tell you. So we've got some variety in our little flock, um, and I've had chickens for about a year and a half now. Mm-hmm. And what made you get into chickens? Yeah, that is um, an interesting question I get asked all the time, um, especially because I do live in the city. Um, so I will say that this started during the pandemic. I very much jumped onto the backyard chicken raising bandwagon, if you will, like so many others. Um, and it really started when I saw a flyer for one of my neighbors um, selling their house. Their house was up for sale and they had a chicken coop in the backyard. And so that was actually a selling point um, that they wanted to advertise that came with the house. Um, not the chickens, just the coop though. So I walked over one day with my son. They were having an open house. Um, I have a five-year-old son and he came with me. He's like, I want to see the chicken coop. And I said, oh, I, I do too. Um, just being an animal lover myself. So we went over and she walked me through the whole setup. You know, like so many chicken owners, she was happy to share her knowledge. You know how this is, Lisa, having animals yourself. Um, um, and share, you know, the names of her chickens and all of this. And so we really kind of fell in love with her setup. We saw how easy, you know, it really, she made it seem. And she told myself and my son, she said, you guys can totally do this. You guys can totally have chickens and have fresh eggs. Your son can help you with the chores and collecting eggs. So it really was this I don't want to say like romantic, idyllic kind of setup that she had, but she really kind of um, romanticized the whole thing. I will say it's not all it's not all rainbows all the time, y'all. Okay, I'm gonna just give you the heads up. I'm gonna keep it real, like Lisa said. But 
it really was something that I felt like, you know, we might be able to do this. Um, and so that was the first taste that we had. And I talked, I did some research. I talked to some other neighbors, you know, who have um, backyard chickens. I went on some online forums and learned about chicken laws in our city. And that was kind of where, where we started. And now we're here. That's awesome. And I love that you mentioned, you know, not only did you do your research, but you also check the laws because that, that is the first place to start. Even, even when you're outside of city limits, you have to be very careful. Um, I know for us, we are outside city limits in a rural area. Um, so we are pretty lucky in the County that we live in. We don't have many limits, but that's the first thing that I've said in my chicken videos is check the statutes because in town, in our rural town, they're not allowed. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I understand it because, you know, if somebody has a rooster or somebody is, um, maybe not being on top of it or being responsible, it can be a nuisance for other neighbors. So I totally understand that. Um, but yeah, I found it odd because Rapid City, South Dakota, right in town, they allow them. That is so interesting. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. That is my number one tip. Number one tip before you get the chickens, definitely do your research, y'all. Um, look at your city ordinances. Every city is different. And even parts, neighborhoods within the city, if they're like small towns, they could have totally different um, rules. So I'll share with you, Lisa, a couple of examples of the ordinances where I live. Yeah. Um, so where I live, they have a limit on how many chickens you can have and no roosters are allowed. And that Mm -hmm. is very common in most urban cities. You likely won't be able to have a rooster. And why is that? Lisa knows this. Um, A rooster's crow can be heard from literally miles away. (laughs) So um, that is the reason why. Um, But interestingly, there are very specific spacing laws as well. So in my city, your coop placement in your yard, in your backyard, on your property line, for example, has to be, I think it's 10 or 15 feet from the neighboring dwelling. Now, that doesn't sound like anything. You're like 10 feet. I don't even have to consider that. On one side of us, on one of our neighbors, it's about, I want to say 12 feet building to building with a fence between. So we obviously couldn't put our coop there. We had to put it on the other side where we have like 25 something plus feet between our house and our neighbor's house on that side. So there's a lot of research involved in like looking at the laws, the ordinances and just your own backyard too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and especially like yourself, you have a family and you have a backyard that you want to utilize for more than just chickens. Um, And you also want to keep your neighbors happy in tight quarters, which is important. Um, And I'm sure there's a lot of unique things that urban chicken owners need to do. And I think one of which was clipping wings because yours were starting to get over the fence. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'll just give you like a lay of the land of our (laughs) our backyard. So our backyard is just a standard suburban lot, I would call it. Um, We're probably not even sitting on like a quarter of an acre. I'm actually not, not totally sure. But anyways, we have a swimming pool in my backyard. (laughs) We've got um, kind of a sloping hill in the back, which is actually great for the chickens to, to be. Um, But yes, certainly some chickens, and this varies by breed or individual bird, um, are more flighty than others um, and like to like to fly. Um, So as I learned with my two Easter eggers, they do like to fly. And when they were young, I'll never forget this. I was in the kitchen in my house looking, um, washing dishes. And I saw one of my Easter eggers fly over the length of the pool, the length, not the width. It was like 20 something. It was, it was impressive. Um, So at that point, I was like, you know what? I think I need to clip their wings. Um, And so I did that. I also have a video on how to do that. If folks are interested, you can look it up on YouTube. Easy, painless. Um, And I know there are some kind of, um, some people feel like you shouldn't clip their wings because by doing so maybe limits their um, ability to escape a predator, right? So you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of that. But where I live, 
it's really, um, <laughs> let's say this, the pros outweighed the cons with the wing clipping. So, so we did that and it's been um, very successful for us. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, your chickens could fly into a backyard where there's dogs and you, you know what I mean? So that's, that's totally. important. Um, I was just, uh, you were talking about flying across the pool, the length of the pool. And I was laughing because you mentioned the word flighty. And you and I were just talking about our Spitzhaubens. We got those two Spitzhaubens, which I had never heard of them before until this lady was selling these bullets. And when our uh, flock was attacked, we needed to get some more that were ready to start laying. And the two Spitzhaubens, I, our chickens get caught behind the net fencing with the pigs, the electric net fencing. And okay. you watch them, they run back and forth like, they can't figure out how they got in. They know how to get out. Well, it's so funny. They'll stand there for hours going back and forth. I found out if you walk over to the fence, the Spitzalbins are so flighty, they jump up and fly up and over and over the turkeys. <laughs> wow. That is so interesting. That's such a great example of like how different chicken breeds are so different from one another. So you can have like a Spitzhalbin who is flighty and maybe doesn't want to be like a cuddly chicken, like a pet chicken. And then you have like uh, Pua, who is my buff Orpington and buff Orpingtons or Orpingtons in general are just known as being like the golden retrievers or the golden labs of the chicken world. <laughs> Great for kids, by the way, and I'm happy to give kind of my favorite like breed recommendations based on um, your setup. Um, but that's another important thing to do um, as well is kind of figure out how much space you have right in your backyard and in an urban setting, how many birds you're going to have. And then from there, do you want to have a regular sized chicken, um, which tend to be between like, I don't know, what would you say, Lisa, five and eight pounds ish? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the, the Orpingtons are all feathers, but <laughs> they are. Oh, one of my Easter eggers weighs more than my Orpington and she looks very sleek. So there's that. Yeah. Um, but there's also bantam breeds that are great for cities and urban uh, people in urban environments because it's like the two for one deal. So two bantams makes up um, takes up the same amount of space as like one regular chicken. So yeah. that's one thing to to keep in mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I, you know, you know I, we have white leghorns and they're always the first to jump up on the, on the top of the coop, the roof. And ours oh, is a, a regular size building. So, Ooh. I mean, you know, they're up on top of the run. They're all over the place. Definitely something to consider if uh, you're in a backyard because they'll easily scale a fence. No problem like the spits out. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Lisa, so do you find that you're, because another thing I wanted to, to talk to the people about was noise and chickens, especially in cities. Do you find that your leghorns are loud? I find that my Rhode Island Reds are a lot louder because they talk more. But my leghorns, when they're doing their egg song, are extremely <laughs> loud. I would say the equivalent of my rooster. And so this is like when you know you've reached like peak chicken lady is like I've heard that and I've I've heard that reputation for leghorns that they're extremely loud um, and also kind of bossy is what I've heard. So for folks out there who are just getting started with chickens or have not yet, you're like, wow, these people are really crazy. There are, there are different personalities of different breeds, and they tend to kind of be true largely um, to the stereotypes. So um, that's something that I have I have learned. If you are in the city, though, I will say, um, you want to be aware that even if you don't have a rooster, hens are noisy. Like, I didn't realize this when I first got started. I thought, oh, they make, like, little soft, like, cluck, 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 and that's it. But as you just mentioned, Lisa, when they lay an egg before and after, they got to sing their egg song, which is basically, like, bark, 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 and it can be <laughs> – extremely my impersonations on point i know oh uh, it can be extremely loud so much so that my neighbors across the street who i'm very friendly with who have had chickens before have told me they have heard my chickens so oh. neighbors two doors down and lisa's nodding she's like oh absolutely so just keep that in mind you won't be able to keep it a secret um so if they're not allowed don't don't risk it don't get chickens period um they they are kind of noisy even the hens <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you manage uh, keeping the rest of the yard with chickens 
right? Because I, I know for me, I, we have two acres and when I let them out to free range, they insist on using my porch as a preening station and bathroom. Why do they do that? Why do they always have to go to the place they are not supposed to go? This is classic. Um, and also so jealous you have two acres. Just hearing somebody say those words, I'm like, I really want that life for me. So we aspire to that. Maybe someday we'll we'll get more land and then I'll have like 60 chickens running around. Oh, <laughs> you'll have a robe on and curlers. You'll be good to go. <laughs> Um, so I will say, yes, we have a pool in our backyard. You have to make the choice if you are going to free range your chickens during the day, or if you're going to keep them contained in like a run setting. So before you get your chickens, really evaluate how much space you have, how you're going to use that space, you know, where you're going to put your coop. Um, for us, originally, we I was like, we're just going to let them free range. They can have the whole yard. They can go wherever the heck they want. It'll be great. It'll be pastoral, beautiful, great. Just see chickens grazing on the lawn. It'll be awesome. Um, and as you know, Lisa, that's a romantic vision. It's nice. And it is that way for maybe a few months. And then maybe around like month six or seven, you're like, where did my flowers go? Didn't I used to have flowers here? Didn't I used to have a nice plant here? Um, and if you have a garden too with like fruits and veggies, you're definitely going to want to um, rope that off, make sure they can't can't get to it. But yes, chickens are destructive. So that's one thing. I feel like I'm not selling this, huh? I'm like, chickens are loud and destructive. <laughs> no, you're being, no. You're being uh, straightforward. And that's what we want is people to have the correct information. I mean, I, I've I have hydroponic tomatoes that I started in the house in the winter and I sit there and watch my rooster go over to it, jump up, pick up a tomato, pick off a tomato, drop it on the floor for the hens. And oh, he sits God. there and does that. Calls them all over. Yeah. <laughs> They're wrecking yeah. balls. So totally get it. it. They totally are. And, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself like I started putting up barriers to keep them out and they would find a way under or through or over. So they're very good at that. I think so two things to consider if you have a regular size backyard are, do you have plants or fruits and vegetables that you care about in your garden? Cause the chickens will destroy those things. And also paved areas or like nice patio furniture. Cause they will gladly poop on it with pride and no regrets. So those are the things to keep in mind. And if that is a problem, it's easy fix, right? You just put them in a contained run um, and make sure they have plenty of space. But these are all like kind of good things to think about before you bring the chickens into your yard. <laughs> and and that's, that's exactly why I want this information to get out there. Because if somebody is in an urban setting, we all know chickens are the gateway. So you know, we want people to know what they're getting into. And sometimes the reality of it is, is, you know, we see the chicks or we see the little ducklings because I know for me, duckling feet and little bills do it for me, but yeah. I don't like raising ducks. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, I'd rather somebody know about it before they got into it. Yeah. And, and that's actually a good thing you bring up too. I know a lot of folks are just fall in love with chicks around Easter and spring. They start bringing them out to your local, like, Osh or whatever stores you have nearby. Um, and it's so easy to just want to take them home. But um, for folks in the city, you want to make sure like you you know what you're what you're getting into. And I'll, I'll admit, chicks were great. I started with chicks and they are, it's such an experience, right? Especially if you have kids um, to raise little chicks and you put so much love into them. And also they become generally very friendly with you um, if you handle them from day old chicks. So they know you really well. And that has been true with, with some of mine. Um, but they also require, you know, they're fragile, right? Um, and I have lost chicks. Um, they have to have certain heat requirements. They have to have a safe brooder that is, they're messy. So you have to change it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, decide if you want to have cute little fuzzy chicks. Who doesn't love a chick though? Um, or you could start with started pullets around six to nine weeks and then you don't have to have the heating they can go right in the coop or you could even buy um laying hens and just start getting mm -hmm. eggs right away because egg chickens won't start laying until they're about six six seven months yeah depending on the breed yeah, yeah some of the fancier yeah. ones take longer I, I call them fancier and then there's some of the right. hardcore like the rhode island reds the golden comets they'll lay pretty early um but i do know you probably should never get an incubator 
You mean to hatch eggs? <laughs> do you mean me myself? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's addictive. It's yeah, addictive. I'm a, we hatch I'm turkeys a... and then we hatch <laughs> barnyard chicks. And I was just like walking around thinking, what else can we hatch? I am so that's the thing. I'm on that cusp because I was like, my sons are at the perfect age, preschool and kindergarten, where they would really benefit from seeing just the miracle of life and the whole cycle. I just think that would be beautiful for them. And I haven't quite ruled it out, but you are right in that the one thing holding me back is like, ooh, that is once we break into that territory with the incubator, then who knows what else is going to hatch around here. (laughs) It's true. It's true. I have a a friend of mine in Texas who, who has quail, duck, chicken and turkey eggs all the time going and it's addictive. So that's, that is quite the dream. I got to admit, that sounds amazing now. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about like the statutes, the ordinances, um, you know, limited space, keeping the backyard clean and functional, I'll say. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you want to talk about your coop setup and how you let yours yeah. forage and free range? Because I think you have a little bit of a different setup than some folks. I do. So yeah, so I started kind of talking about I did let them free range have full rain over the whole backyard in the beginning. And then once I started seeing kind of all the dirt they were kicking up my sidewalks and the poop was everywhere, I was like, you know, we need to rope this in a little bit. So now I do a mix of confined run time and free ranging in the yard. And that seems at least for now to be the happy medium. So I'll say for most half of the day, they are in a run. And the way that I've kind of set that up is it runs along um, the side fence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good it's a good space for them. It's like an L shape, and that um, dirt run on the side of my yard is connected to um, their omelet egg glue wire run. So it's like an L shape run, and then I do have the omelet egg glue cube, which is a coop that's prefabricated. You can you can purchase it. It's a plastic coop, um, and I love it for our birds. I think it's a great solution for backyard urban chicken keepers um, to have about I would say max six regular sized hens. Mm-hmm. It's a handy little coop, and you can see um, pictures and a tour on my on my Instagram page. Um, but certainly there are pros and cons to coops, right? You can always, if you're a DIYer, which I am not, let's be honest, that's why I bought one. Um, but you can make your own. You can find, um, you can ask people, there are people who will make them and deliver them to your house, like full wooden coops. There are so many different uh, coop and run options to explore. So depending on your space, you got to do the setup that works for you. And I like your coop because I, the first thing I think of when I look at it is number one, you can move it. Yeah. If you needed to. And number two, I think of cleanliness. Yeah. So the egg glue is great for that. And if anybody here is interested, I can give you a discount um, because I'm an ambassador. They are expensive. So got to say that out up front. They're way more expensive than a wooden coop would be cheap for you to make. Um, it is. But you're right. It is because it's plastic. There's less of a chance of having like a mite infestation, which could happen um, to chickens. It's easy to clean. Um, it has a poop drawer that you just slide out empty, slide back in. And then it has a cute little nest box on the side and you just take off the door and you can reach in and it's right at like waist high. So everything is all there. I think for people in the city, it makes a lot of sense. Now, if I had two acres like you, uh, Lisa, I would probably um, build one or have someone build it (laughs) for me and have like a full setup and a full run um, constructed. Um, But if you are in a regular size backyard, the omelet cube is, is fantastic. Can't say enough good things about it. Yeah, I, I love the fact that it's plastic and the all I can think of is I can hose it down and that's just fabulous. I mean, we've power washed ours, um, you know, but it's it's hard to do because the wood takes so long to dry. But like you said, then you have to watch out for the mites and all of that. Yeah. And I think there's like ways around it, right? I think everybody, I think there's no right or wrong way to do it. It all just depends on on your personal setup. And I Mm -hmm. love talking to different people, even in cities who have different setups. And what I love about this community is that everybody is so open and willing to share their knowledge. And, you know, it's kind of this judgment-free, safe space where people can exchange ideas. Here's what works for me. Here's what doesn't work for me. And um, everybody has a sense of humor about it too which, which I love. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have to chickens provide hours yeah. of entertainment, especially, um, with the crazy things that they do for sure. 
Um, what are some, do you have to deal with predators where, where you are? Yeah. So here, and this is something I get asked a lot about with the omelet cube is, is it predator proof? So here um, in California, our biggest predator for me in a city is hawks over overhead. So hawk danger, aerial predators is by far the biggest um, concern. I think second and third would be like possums and raccoons, nocturnal ground predators. Um, so I will say the omelet cube is great if you don't have like bears if you have like bears or like mountain lions or like coyotes or foxes foxes i've heard are very crafty we don't have those here but they can kind of dig under your run so you want to make sure that you take all those precautions um but yeah we've had you know hawks dive down um for my girls i've, I've seen it happen and you can even be you hear these stories all the time where you could even be in your backyard with them, not 20 feet away. And mm -hmm. they're pretty bold they'll, and they're so fast. It happens real quick. Um, so you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons, right? Of like the quality of life you're gonna give your chickens if they're out free ranging versus being fully predator safe in a covered run, for example, but maybe their quality of life, they aren't able to forage as much um, and some other things. You kind of have to weigh, I don't know, the pros and cons. What, what's your take on? on free ranging. So when we had, we used to let them free range all the time. Um, what we've done as a practice is let them out after they're done laying. And the reason why we do that is because we do sell our eggs and we would prefer that they lay in the boxes. Now my original yeah. girls are amazing. They will, you'll see them run back to the coop if they haven't laid and they'll lay and come back out. Um, some of the newer ones, not so much. Um, so usually I let them out in the afternoon and they'll free range until dark and I love letting them free range. Um, so we had an owl that did get one of our golden comets the first year. And then we did have a dog come on the property and attack the flock. And for a while I was like, that's it. We're not free ranging them, but yeah. that's not fair to them. Right. So, you know, we free range when we're home. So if I have to go somewhere, they'll stay in uh, just yeah. because I prefer to be here, even if I'm in the house. Now, the attack happened while I was home, but yeah. it's just my little weirdness that I prefer to do. Um, and it seems to work out fine. And then I chase them back in at night. One of the things that we've done to help uh, alleviate some of the overhead predators is I've taught them recall. So I'll go chook chook and they'll come flying and That's for the most part. So I can call them and shake some corn and they'll all come to the coop or come wherever I call them to. And it's wild because I won't even see half of them. And all of a sudden they all show up on the porch. <laughs> So that's been a, that was something that was taught to me, um, I think by another YouTuber, I think it was Jamie over at uh, Gil Guildford Farm or Guildford Farms, who said from the time they're in the brooder, teach them to come when called. And that's worked out well for us. Yeah, I love that. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because my girls too, um, I mean, it's like, they're like kids. You hear like a snack wrapper crinkling and they all just come. And I tell you, that wasn't even intentional. Although I do, I would recommend exactly what you say and teach them when they're chicks, che teach them to come to you um, with a call. Um, yeah, mine here, like a crinkle of a snack bag or like the worm bin and they just head in. So they're really great that way. And some, some chickens have better predator um, or, or better with predators than others. Like my silkies, for example, are just sitting ducks, right? So I actually try to keep my silkies under in the run uh, more often because they have a poofy crown that makes it hard for them to see, right? So yeah. they're at a disadvantage that way. They can't fly based on their feathering. Um, they're really, and I've just heard of predators where they just take out all your silkies in, in minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's an unfortunate reality of owning chickens. Everything wants to eat a chicken, right? They're, they're not safe from anything. Yep. My dog actually um, unfortunately got into the run and killed one of my silkies, which was heartbreaking. Um, and it's crazy because I think when I started this, I thought they're just, they're just chickens. Like I'll get chickens and I'll get eggs, which is great. But if you live in a city and you have seven, you know them by name. I can look at which egg and tell you exactly which chicken <laughs> laid it and they become like pets a little bit. And so, you know, you have to be able to, to recognize that and, and weigh the pros and cons.
<laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. They do become pets. You know, I remember when I, we got our first uh, dozen, I got four of each of three different breeds and I named them all, but I couldn't tell them apart. <laughs> they all looked alike. So I was like, okay, y'all have names. I have no idea who you are because you're little chicks, you know? So yeah. it's really funny now because we have one buff Orpington who follows me around like a little puppy dog. Aww. And that's Lucy, you know? And then it's like, they, we had like the bearded lady, you know, it's, it's yeah. like some of the quirkier ones, you know? They yeah. Get, that stand out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, that's like, I know we've talked about kind of all the things to be like aware of and careful of and no laws and all this, but really like the joys of having chickens in the city far outweigh the cons and the worries. Like I never imagined it would bring our family so much joy and nutrition to have fresh eggs every single day. And I give them to friends and family and just the quality of the eggs is so different than anything you could buy in a store. Um, it really is. And you have to taste it um, to believe it. So the eggs are great. The chickens are wonderful pets. They're hilarious to watch. Their antics will never bore you. We call it chicken TV here in the chicken world. You just, I just find myself standing there like this with my arms crossed by myself in my backyard, just <laughs> laughing to myself like a crazy person. Like, huh, you're so hilarious. Pua. <laughs> <laughs> so I realize how crazy that seems, but they're just wonderful. They just steal your heart. <laughs> they really do. They really do. And you're not alone because there were, uh, you know, such a large increase in the, you know, amount of chicken owners, new chicken owners during the pandemic um, that really took it on and have gone with it. So yeah, um, it's pretty cool that way. And I, and I think it's great because it's great to see so many people starting to take some ownership of not only the pet process, but also having their own food supply. Right. Totally. I realize we do what we can, but that's just so important. And there is nothing like fresh eggs. Yeah. And I think it, you know, if anything, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that we took the time to slow down, especially I think for those of the, in the city who had never thought that we could bring a slice of country or farm living into our backyards. You know, we started raising herbs on like a windowsill and maybe that turned into a growing tomatoes in the backyard and maybe then that turned into chicken. So I did, I have heard chickens are the gateway drug to like all kinds of other things. So be careful what you get yourself into. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's not about like, you don't have to commit necessarily to this idea of rural living. If you're in the city, it's kind of do what you can and give back to the earth in a way that feels realistic to you and that you can do, teach your kids to do the same thing. And if that's something as small as understanding where your food comes from, right, and, and doing it that way, then that's, um, then that's one way to do it. You just do what you can. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful for us. We are not farmers by any means. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's awesome. And we're strong proponents of just, you know, try to grow something, you know, wherever you are, no matter what your limitations are, just do one thing. You know, yeah. it feels good to take control over certain things for us, especially in a world where we can't take control over a lot of things. Yeah, that's 100% correct. And I and I think for people who live in the city, we're so caught up in things like, you know, commuting to our jobs and like picking up food at the drive through to feed our kids, which I completely, which I did last night. Like, you know, but you can um, do what you can do. what feels comfortable for you. Right. Um, and so for us, we never thought chickens and eggs would be a reality, but it's actually like easier, you know, and more possible um, than we thought it would be. So if you are one of those people who's on the fence, you know, but you do have the right setup in your, in your yard and you have, um, you know, the ability to care for, for a small flock. I say, do it. You could totally do this. That's my quote. You could totally do this. My neighbor said that to me and I will say that to anybody else. You could totally have chickens in your backyard. <laughs> you can, you can. What are some other unique uh, or what you feel is unique to an urban setting uh, in raising chickens? So I think one thing to consider, and this is, this is me keeping it real, is there's a lot of chicken poop. 
And what are you going to do with a chicken poop in your yard? Because for me, you know, I have a plot of lawn, right? And if you free range, whether you free range them or keep them in a run, you've got to do something with the poop. And if you live in a suburban neighborhood, typically what that means is you would either throw it in the garbage can to be picked up once a week with your other trash, or um, you can find something else to do with it. So I know you already know this, Lisa, but I <laughs> sell our chicken manure, which people think is kind of incredible um, and hard to believe and silly. I do too. Um, but what I love about it is that just the idea of throwing chicken poop in my trash can just kind of, I don't know, it feels weird to me. But in the city, you will find gardeners who will gladly take it off your hands. They will pay you for it. They will throw money at you and say, I want that chicken manure because it's like black gold for their gardens. So mm -hmm. I actually have a guy, he comes once a month. Um, I sell my chicken manure by the five gallon bucket um, and which does require me collecting it right from the run and from the lawn, but that's fine. Right. Um, I put it in the bucket. He comes by, he picks it up, he pays me for it and he uses it on his, um, he has an orchard of fruit trees. So it's been a really effective way to get the poop off my hands. Um, but generally, yes, if you're going to have chickens in a regular size backyard, have a plan for <laughs> how you're going to deal with the poop. Um, <laughs> cause it, it adds up. It's a lot. And, it, and and that goes hand in hand with the chicken owners, right? Because there was a huge rise in home gardeners at the same time. So that that's brilliant. That's wonderful. There's a lot of people who do that with rabbits as well. Yeah. In fact, that's what somebody told. In fact, my guy was actually asking me too, do you know anybody who have um, who has rabbits because and I used to have rabbits and I was like I had no idea their manure was such good fertilizer um, so and and I think different people do it different ways like some people can compost it and let it age a bit I actually just sell mine to my guy hot or fresh um, and he puts it right on he doesn't have a problem but if you go onto groups um, or apps like next door or even Craigslist mm -hmm. I mean I had people just banging down my door who wanted this chicken manure it was so funny it still is funny to me because I just had no idea. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They usually talk about the benefits uh, or the differences, I should say, between uh, chicken manure is it's hot. And so they tell you to let it yeah. sit and compost it. Um, obviously, that's good. He found an application. And then rabbits uh, apparently are not hot and you can just put that on oh. anything. And so a lot of people will take rabbit pellets and put them right in the ground when they plant. Oh, uh, as fertilizer. And they say it's amazing. I, we don't have rabbits. Um, I, I'm still kind of torn on that. So no, I'm, I'm very particular. <laughs> I love my pigs. <laughs> That's true. Oh, you got such a good thing going on with your little piggies too. Yeah. So, so what other, other things you think are challenging for urban settings? that you think are um, important. Let's see. We talked about the noise. We talked about mm -hmm. the poop. Um, oh, one thing. So what happens if one of my fuzzy chicks turns out to be a rooster? <laughs> this is one of the biggest things because it's likely in your city – roosters are not allowed. And so even though you can buy chicks that are sexed from a hatchery or a breeder, Lisa knows this, every chicken owner will tell you this, you will get one that is incorrectly um, or missexed, and you will end up with a rooster. So if you're in the city, what do you do? Um, here are some things that I found helpful because I've had to give up two birds that turned out to be roosters. Um, you can look on sites like Nextdoor and find chicken groups and forums and see if somebody will take them off your hands. I will say you can also um, put them up for free or sell on Craigslist and they will go very quickly. However, you have to be aware that they will probably, you just don't know the quality of life. Likely they'll be eaten. Right. You don't know kind of what people will do with mm -hmm. them on Craigslist. Um, but I find that if you try and offer them up and rehome them on um, like next door chicken groups or a local um, feed store even is where I took one of mine who, who gladly took it um, and took it to a, a rooster rescue up in the mountains. So there are definitely ways. It's not impossible. Um, and likely it, it probably will happen to you if you do get chicks at some point. Yeah. <laughs> FYI, when you hatch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's another reason, right? Ooh. Why I don't, because then you just don't know. And I, the thought of having to rehome like four roosters or something out of 12 or maybe 10 out of 12 is just <laughs> a lot. 
Um, so that's yeah. another thing to consider. We we have we have seven barnyard chicks. They were barnyard mixes, and we hatched. Let's see. So seven hatched successfully, and I thought, wow, this is great. I think they're all hens. <laughs> I <laughs> I think we have we have at least three roosters, maybe four. That's not bad out of twelve. Yeah. Well, seven. Oh, out of seven. Oh, that, okay. That's not great. Yeah. But. And I don't, I don't, I only need one rooster because he's really active. The one that we have, the mature one we have. And yeah. so with the 20 something, you know, ladies, we really need a, a larger ratio of ladies for, cause he has favorites. Yeah. Um, so we have to make sure of that. So I really don't need any more. So I'm going to try and rehome them. Um, once I can confirm how many I have. But. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes um, you can't tell, right, until they're at least, I don't know, nine, six to nine weeks. But even some breeds like um, my Polish and Silkies are particularly hard to sex. And so sometimes you won't even know until you hear a, a crow or they just don't lay. Um, also, some hens can crow. I've never had that, but some hens yeah. do, I've heard. Um, so it can be it can be tough. But yeah, certainly have a plan if you get chicks and they turn out to be roosters. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Did, was there anything that we missed? Um, I will say, I'm looking at my, I just had a couple of notes here that I wanted to reference. If you're in the city, I will say, and you're doing your research, um, look at the different breeds and like, it's so fun. That was like the most fun part for me. Um, you can get smaller breeds if you're tight on space, you know, if you're, if you have kids and you want to really docile chicken, you know, look into silkies or Cochins or Orpingtons. Um, you know, Lisa, jump in here too with your favorites, but you can really do your breed research and, um, also, get breeds that give you different colored eggs. If that's something that you care about, you can have what's called an egg rainbow and get um, a Marans, which lays like a dark chocolatey colored egg. You can get an olive egger, which lays like an olive green type egg. I mean, it's just simply amazing. Um, and so for us, it was a mix of different colored eggs and then chickens that had great personalities for my kids. And I, I'm pretty happy with the flock that we have. So I think it's an important consideration for people in the city, just because you can only have maybe six chickens. So each bird then becomes a, a crucial decision of like what breed you want it, want it to be. Um, so yeah, I think, but I think that's, I think that's it. Um, Oh, one thing, and then one of the questions I get asked a lot in the city is, how many chickens um, do I need to feed my family a week, right? So I say, if you have a family of four, for example, maybe three to four hens will get you well over, well over a dozen a week. Um, mm -hmm. And you can start there. I will also say, somebody gave me this advice, and I can't echo it enough, always get one or two more than you think, <laughs> at least is nodding, than you think you need. So for example, I started out on this journey. I was like, we're only getting three. We're only getting three chickens and that's it. As chicks, especially, it becomes important to get a few more. Why? Because they're so fragile and they could die of so many things. Unfortunately, it's the cruel uh, reality of nature. Um, they could get sick. They could get too cold. They could get too hot. Just anything, right? And then what happens is if you lose one, you later have to add birds or integrate chickens. Mm -hmm. And that process is my least favorite part of chicken keeping because it is a long process. Um, chickens don't just, you can't just bring a new chicken in and then everybody gets along. They have a very specific social structure. They likely could, they could peck on a newcomer to death even and bully them really badly. Yeah. So you have to monitor and introduce carefully. And, and that process can be annoying for lack of a better term. It so is annoying. The more you have at the outset that you can reasonably, you know, have space for, definitely plan for that. <laughs> We're having to um, mix flocks multiple times this year, which is not something we choose to do. Yeah. And you can tell that the, the old, the OGs are kind of like, let's pick on this one. Yeah. And, you know, cause we do the, you know, when the OGs free range, they get used to the other ones who are in the other temporary coop. 
Um, and then what we do is one night we bring them in. Then they stay in the coop for three days in the, in the run. Okay. So that way they know they're safe and they know that's where they return when they free range. Yep. So bringing them in at night has been really beneficial. Uh, the first day is pretty noisy, <laughs> but it seems like after that first day, they get the majority out of their system and the, and the newer flock stays out of the way of the other flock. And they okay. learn to do what they need to do. And then over a few weeks time, they figure it out together. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And it's funny because sometimes people call chickens dumb. I have a buff <laughs> Brahma that we just obtained uh, not long ago. And she was roosting on our nesting boxes. And so I, at night I go in there, I pick the ones doing that off and put them on the roost, try to put them away from the OGs. Right. Yeah. Well, I find out she's in the corner on the roost. Why is she there? Cause she can put her head behind the structure of the nesting box and the OGs can't pick on her. Oh, I mean, you know, it's listen, true though. Like, they're brutal. When it comes to insti instincts, they're very smart. Now, I think chickens are dumb in a lot of ways, such as they'll pace the run with the door right there and they won't know how to get out. Um, they're dumb that way. But, you know, most of the time when it comes to like escaping predators, they're very um, smart and have good instincts or like where to lay eggs and whatnot. But yeah, you make a good point. And I actually wonder too, Lisa, I've always wondered this, if in bigger flocks, like if I had all this land and I had a lot more chickens, like double what I have now, if it would be easier to introduce like five new hens to an OG group of 10 versus my seven, if I bring in two, it's real obvious who they can hone in on. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's the same. Because <laughs> I have the same offenders in the OG oh. flock who are relentless. Um, yeah. But our locking them in the coop for, for three days is what we were taught to do when you move the chicks out to the coop, right? So uh -huh. you, you teach them that it's safe and that way they know it's home base, they can return to it. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, when it comes to predators, um, one of the things chickens will do, especially in this setting, is we have a lot of granite rock outcroppings. Okay. And there's crevices. So when a predator happens, the chickens will, in an adrenaline state, will go into a crevice, but then they oh, can't get back out. Get out. Yeah. So when <laughs> we have coming. predators, I'm calling like crazy and they're thinking the predator's still there. And so it takes them a while to come out. Yeah. And then when we can't, when we do a head count and we're still missing, we have to go back out and look at all the crevices because somebody's usually stuck and Ryan's usually fishing them out oh. of different places like bushes, trees. I mean, yeah. you name it. Yeah, they, it can take them a while. I can always tell when there was a hawk swoop or there's a hawk nearby because they'll just freeze. They're not scratching in the dirt. They're not making noise. You can tell that something is amiss. And these are cues that you pick up, you know, over the first maybe year of chicken keeping cued into their behavior. Um, and they also get more predator wise as well, ideally as they get older. Right. So I will say my OGs are always have an eye to the sky. They're always communicating. Whereas my young, young, dumb, silkies, poor things, they just, they don't stand a chance. <laughs> So I do have one question for you. How do your neighbors uh, react to you having chickens? And did you like have a conversation with them before you got chickens? Just because oh, I that's could see such that a good a, question. A bone of contention. Yeah, that's such a good question, especially because I'll be real. They're real close to us on both sides and across the street. I mean, it's very standard suburbs here. So we did not ask for permission. We we had that conversation, my husband and I, of like, should we, should we do that? Um, for us, we decided not to because we didn't know just how noisy they would be. So we didn't want to like set ourselves up for something that wasn't going to be a problem. Um, and as it turns out, some of my girls are very loud and my neighbor, it's no secret. I'm sure all my neighbors know somebody's got chickens. However, once, you know, we can cross that bridge and we get there and we have. So now what we do is when, whenever we have extra eggs, we bring them next door. We bring them to all, our neighbors. Just any, anybody with an earshot is usually who I try <laughs> to get eggs to. And let me tell you that, 
not only smooths things over, but that has piqued interest in our neighbors of like, um, really? So how many chickens do you have and how many eggs a week do you get? Like my kids would really love that. Can they come over sometime? It's actually become this community building thing where people aren't just, I, I honestly don't know if they're annoyed by the noise. We haven't heard any complaints yet. But they're happy to receive. They're happy to receive the eggs, and they're also very curious. They take it a take it a step further, and it's a conversation starter. So, you know, for us, it's been it's been really great. Um, but I'm not gonna lie; I still start sweat breaking out in a sweat when my loudest Easter egger is going off because it sounds like something's getting killed back there. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. I'm I'm a firm believer of it's it's my property. And yeah. I will do what I can to keep everything great with the neighbors, but I won't ask permission. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as long as, look, as long as you're um, within legal limits and, right. you know, you don't have, like, I'm not smuggling six roosters back here or anything crazy like that. I'm minding my business. And I think all of our, you know, in a community, in a neighborhood, everybody has their thing. Like we have somebody who works on a race car next door and like races for fun. We've got motorcycles. We've got people with dogs that yap. So there's always, a, everybody has their thing, right? And so right. it's just this community thing. Um, but generally, you know, we've never had any complaints. People are very curious. Um, and I've had little, one of my silkies, like I'll just walk around the neighborhood holding her with my son and people come running out. They're like, what is that? <laughs> so it's a great conversation starter, a way to, to form friendships with your neighbors. <laughs> and the good news is, is, you know, when, when dusk hits, they're quiet. And um, the only thing is when they lay early in the morning. So really, they're not the worst thing you can have. I totally agree. If you've ever heard like a leaf blower, like a landscaping, like a leaf blower, it's, I would say it's quieter than that and lasts for maybe 10 minutes um, and then it's over. So it's very incremental, totally doable, not something to stress over. Um, yeah, you could totally have chickens in the city. Totally can. <laughs> well, Kristen, you have done an amazing job providing us um, some information for folks who are in urban settings who may be on the cusp of getting chickens. Um, oh. I do want to say that I do love my lavender Orpington. I love her. That's Lucy. Um, and I do, I, I love all the different breeds, but I, I agree with you on the breed standpoint. You need to pick breeds that are going to work for your climate. Um, mm -hmm. because you and I are in very different climates. Mm -hmm. Everybody says Leghorns are not good for cold climates. They're cold hardy, even though they have those big, just a rooster would have more of an issue than the hen because of the combs. Yeah. Um, but you've just been such a wonderful guest and we thank you so Aww. much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. I can't believe like an hour is already up because you already know I could talk chickens all day long. I probably bored half this audience to sleep, but anybody <laughs> who wants to talk chickens anytime, hit me up. <laughs> exactly. That'll be awesome. And again, everyone, we will have Kristen's Instagram account uh, in the description box below, as well as pinned to the chat. And I will also set it up with Kristen. So that way she is in the chat when this premieres. So Fantastic. thank you so much. And everyone have a great day and stay tuned for another episode of the Homesteading Academy. Thanks Take everybody. Bye-bye.